This is Dr. Mark Evans presenting the paper, Improving the Interpretation of Electronic Fetal Monitoring, the Fetal Reserve Index, written by myself, David Britt, Shara Evans, and Lawrence DeVoe. The presentation will be by Dr. DeVoe and myself. Disclosure is that Dr. Evans has patents on the process described. Electronic fetal monitoring has been in use for more than 50 years. It was developed to prevent stillbirths. The hope was that it would also prevent adverse neonatal outcomes. Interpreting it is subjective and nuanced. It has created confusion as to whether it's a screening test or a diagnostic one. It was introduced into practice in the 1970s with no randomized trials. Originally, EFM was used to decide who needed a fetal scalp sample for pH. And later, the scalp sampling was abandoned as fetal monitoring was accepted as being just as good. Electronic fetal monitoring is clearly a screening test with both false positives and negatives. It has prevented many tragedies, but has led to many unnecessary interventions. It has been embroiled in medical legal cases, which evolve into a battle of expert witnesses. In 2003, ACOG published a monograph, The Green Book, which was intended to sort fact from fiction. It was a good start. There have been many arguments about what percentage of cerebral palsy has a genetic origin anywhere from zero to 90 to 100%. The realistic number we believe is about 30%. The category was, system was introduced for management in 2008. However, there were no clinical trials before its introduction. Category one shows no concern. Category three is an emergency and requires immediate action. Category two is intermediate, but has no uniform response and there are complex protocols. 80% of cases reach category two, which is statistically problematic. Even its key opinion leaders admit that it misses 50% of the problem cases. Many attempts have been made to improve the approach. The next several slides will be presented by Dr. Lawrence DeVoe on these developments. This slide categorizes previous automated systems to improve fetal heart rate analysis and interpretation. In the 1990s, continuous fetal pulse oximetry systems were developed to enhance conventional fetal heart rate monitoring, but such systems were abandoned in the U.S. when a large randomized control trial showed no improvement in primary perinatal outcomes. Developed in the late 1990s, STAN was an automated system coupling fetal ECG analysis to FHR patterns. Meta-analysis showed a few STAN RCTs did lower rates of neonatal metabolic acidosis in operative deliveries. The Maternal Fetal Medicine Unit Network STAN RCT found no differences in adverse perinatal outcomes or route of delivery and led to STANs being abandoned in U.S. labor units. This table lists a number of previous efforts to develop automated systems for intrapartum fetal heart rate interpretation and alerting. Such systems use rule bases like Oxford, Sonicade, Traceview, and Sysporto, or hybrid rule-based neural network frameworks like Infant and Paracom. To date, none of these systems has shown reduction in adverse perinatal outcomes when subjected to clinical trials. In summary, computerized analysis of intrapartum fetal heart rate patterns may be more reliable and precise than visual FHR assessment but the few studies that have been performed do not show its use improves detection of acidemia or fetal compromise. We developed the fetal reserve index to be a quantitative measurement of how much fetal reserve the fetus has. It breaks the fetal tracing into four quantifiable components, fetal heart rate, variability, accelerations, and decelerations, but then adds to it in a formal manner is there increased uterine activity? Is there a maternal risk factor, like is the mother diabetic? Is there an obstetrical risk factor, such as IUGR? And is there a fetal risk factor, uh, such as meconium? The eight categories are scored one if normal and zero if not. So the maximum score of eight out of eight is 100%. If you've lost two, you're 75%, four, 50%, and lost seven, 12 and a half percent. And then the cases are divided into three categories, green greater than 50%, yellow 26 to 50, and red zero to 25. The top right-hand corner shows four cases as four uh, rectangles going downward from, from top to bottom. The first, two case, first case stays completely in green, 
The second has a little bit of yellow in the second stage. The third and fourth cases have small amounts of red even in the second stage. These cases all turned out normal. We then looked at cases that came into labor clean, category one, but went home with the baby with cerebral palsy. These cases went red early and stayed there for an average of five hours. And all the cases in this grouping were red for more than two hours. Reaching the red zone is not a panic. In American football terms, it's not fourth down in four, it's more like third down in four. When I lecture in Europe and nobody knows what I'm talking about, I say in soccer terms, it's like defending a corner kick, not like defending a penalty kick. Getting into the red zone, however, starts a shot clock like in basketball. Here, we get senior people there to evaluate the situation, come up with a game plan, and we give the patient 40 minutes to get out of the red zone or it triggers the ACOG 30 minute to delivery rule. And all the control cases seem to be resolved in less than an hour. And all cerebral palsy cases were in the red zone for more than two hours. In our first published study, we took 60 babies who came into labor clean, who went home with a baby with cerebral palsy versus 360 controls and scored, them by the, scored the same cases by three methods. The ACOG monograph system, which is technically postnatal, but we're pretending we knew it prenatally, category three, and the fetal reserve index. The sensitivity of the monograph was only 28%. Category three was 45%. And in this first study, we identified all the abnormals. Now, of course, it will never stay 100%, but clearly it was a good start deserving further investigation. Evaluation of these cases showed that the pH of the cerebral palsy cases was considerably lower than the controls, but over half the, pH, half the pHs of CP cases did not go below the threshold of 7.00 as required by the ACOG monograph criteria. Thus, we believe the criteria needed to be reevaluated. In a prospective study, we showed that about 25% of all cases got into the red zone. However, for those cases managed by routine management, the emergency delivery rate was 17%. The emergency C-section rate was 8.5%. Of those cases managed by the FRI criteria and early introduction of intrauterine resuscitation, emergency deliveries were lowered to 4% and emergency C-sections were lowered to 3.5%. And that's because of the double of doubling of the use of intrauterine resuscitation. Our initial observations show that clearly the FRI had better performance metrics than the category system in identifying cerebral palsy, having earlier identification of risk status, and reducing the emergency C-section and operative vaginal deliveries. The next question was, how do we prove that the performance comes from better prediction of the normal and abnormal physiology? We were able to analyze a set of old data from the early 1970s by Dr. Edward Hahn. These data sat unanalyzed for 45 years. They included several hundred high-risk cases with rupture of membranes, continuously and intensively monitored through delivery, and for one hour postpartum, including heart rate and umbilical artery catheterizations, we allowed bloods to be obtained at 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64 minutes, and there was continuous neonatal heart rate tracing for an hour, and the type of strips created are shown on this slide. If one breaks the patients into three categories of the last FRI score before delivery and thinks of them as good, bad, and ugly, the ugly cases, the worst about 10% of patients, show a profound tachycardia with loss of variability, and the heart rate does not return to normal in 50% of the cases, even by 50 minutes postpartum. Evaluation of the FRI score, as well as scalp sample, base excess, and pH, shows that deterioration of the fetal status actually begins far earlier in the first stage of labor than is commonly appreciated. In fact, one can judge the FRI scores by the multiples of the median for the given cervical dilatation. And for example, a minus nine base excess at nine centimeters is pretty close to the median but a minus nine at three centimeters is already suggesting high risk. Furthermore, this slide shows that deterioration continues after delivery and nadirs typically between four and eight minutes 
postpartum before recovery begins. Our data suggests that overall 85% of patients have significant tachycardia. In fact, if the first 10 minutes of the neonatal heart rate tracing were seen as the last 10 minutes of the fetal tracing, about 25% cases, of cases would be considered category three. Likewise, pH and base excess get worse before they get better, and one third of cases reach the threshold of minus 12 millimoles per liter, which is the threshold for CP risk. In fact, half the cases who are at minus 10 before delivery fall to less than minus 12 after delivery. Thus, we believe that a significant period for metabolic acidemia occurs after birth when, no, when most babies are not being evaluated closely and those who are, they're looking for bradycardia, not tachycardia. Such may help explain why standard monitoring has limited metrics. We've also shown that the FRI is a good approximation of base excess NPH and will improve with more data and weighting of the risk factors, which will be coming in subsequent versions. We also broke down cases by how many contractions they had in the last half hour before birth. And we believe that the, F, that the cutoff should be no more than four contractions per 10 minutes, not the ACOG criteria of five, because in between four and five contractions per 10 minutes is where the deterioration of the fetal status begins to show. If you use a cutoff at five, the it, baby basically falls off the cliff once you get there because too many cases between four and five are considered normal when in fact we believe they should be considered already problematic. One of the dogmas of the 1970s and 80s was that mid forceps caused a lot of damage to babies. We looked at those cases in this data set that were delivered by forces versus NSVDs. And the initial analysis showed that in fact, the pH and base excess of babies delivered by forceps versus NSVDs was in fact lower at birth, thus suggesting that perhaps the critics were right. However, looking at the fetal scalp samples an hour before delivery shows that the deterioration had already begun, leading to the generalizable conclusion that the forceps didn't cause the compromise. The compromise actually caused the forceps. The KLS platforms takes inputs from the electronic fetal monitor and from the electronic medical record and combines them to create the FRI score. The FRI score can be read on an iPad on top of the monitor, on a cell phone, at the nursing station, or literally halfway around the world in real time, such that, imp such that inputs and advice can be obtained. The, this gray journal paper is our 15th referee publication. We have shown that the FRI has improved sensitivity for cerebral palsy than existing methods, which were the ACOG category system and the ACOG monograph systems. The FRI can safely reduce the rates of emergency cesarean and vaginal deliveries by about 65%, which lowers morbidity, mortality, and costs. It likely can also reduce the overall cesarean delivery, delivery rate. We conservatively estimate by about 2%, which could save the United States over $750 million a year in costs. The FRI identifies impending compromise earlier in labor, allowing for easier and less drastic interventions to allow for safe deliveries. One of the reasons that traditional EFM has limited statistical performance is that the early postpartum period is actually a time of considerable risk. The last FRI score before delivery accurately distinguishes cases at high risk and for whom early intervention could be very beneficial. The platform is being finalized and implementation studies are now beginning. Here's a list of the papers that we have published on the subject. Thank you very much.